Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order. I'd certainly like to welcome all of you that are with us this evening. If we could just take a moment of silent meditation, please. Thank you. I would ask. Councilman Ed Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we have the honor of being led in the Pledge of Allegiance by members of Troop 412 from the Trinity Avenue Presbyterian Church. And upon their signals, we will stand and say the pledge. <laughs> to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk. Could you call the roll, please? Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Present. <coughs> Councilmember Davis. Here. Councilmember Johnson. Here. Councilmember Moffitt. Here. Councilmember Reese. Here. And Councilmember Shule. Thank you. Here. Ask Councilman Davis if he would join me at the roster, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to uh, read the proclamation in honor of Rodney Ray Rogers. Um, whereas Rodney Rogers was born in Durham, North Carolina in 1971 and spent his formative years in the McDougal Terrace neighborhood, and whereas Rodney Rogers attended Hillside High School and played multiple sports before graduating in the class of 1990, and whereas Rodney Rogers was named the 1990 high North Carolina High School Male Basketball Player of the Year and was recruited by a large number of colleges and universities from across the United States, and whereas Rodney Rogers played in the National McDonald's All-Star Game for high school seniors before becoming a student athlete at Wake Forest University, where he was coached by former Durham High School coach Dave Odom. And whereas Rodney Rogers, in a close balloting with Duke's Grant Hill, Mr. Shul, um, won the honor of being the 1990-1991 Atlantic Coast Conference Men's Basketball Rookie of the Year. And whereas Rodney Rogers had more than had two more stellar years as a student athlete at Wake Forest, 
and in 1993 was named the ACC Player of the Year. And whereas Rodney Rogers was the ninth overall pick in the 1993 National Basketball Association draft and started his NBA career with the Denver Nuggets. And whereas Rodney Rogers played in the NBA from 1993 until he retired in 2005. In addition to playing for the Nuggets, wow. Rodney paid, played for the Phoenix Suns, the Los Angeles Clippers, the Boston Celtics, the New Jersey <coughs> Nets, the New Orleans Hornets, and the Philadelphia 76ers. It was during his tenure with Phoenix that he was so effective coming off the bench that he was selected as the NBA sixth man of the year. And whereas in one famous 1994 game between the Denver uh, Nuggets and the Utah Jazz, Rodney miraculously hit a flurry of three straight three-point shots within an eight-second span, <laughs> and thus scoring nine points in just eight seconds. And whereas the, at, during the height of his NBA career, Wake Forest University held a, ceremonial, a ceremony in honor of Rodney and retired his, famous, his famed number 54, which he wore at Hillside, at Wake Forest, and for each one of the NBA teams for which he played. And whereas Rodney Rogers had been, has been inducted into the Wake Forest University Hall of Fame and the North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame, and whereas Rodney gained a grand reputation for his thunderous dunk shots, and since sports writers and broadcasters appreciated his Durham roots, he was often and is often referred to as the Durham Bull in sports circles. And whereas upon his retirement from professional basketball, Rodney returned to his beloved hometown and voluntarily, uh, and, not, that is, and that was a choice he made, not uh, by necessity. He decided to work for the city of Durham where he quickly rose to the ranks of supervisor, to the rank of supervisor within the public works department. And whereas in 2008, Rodney was involved in a recreational motorbike accident in rural Vance County. His injuries led to a paralyzed condition from his shoulders down. However, Rodney now, however, Rodney, who lived and works in Person County, in the Person County town of Timberlake, continues to travel and speak about his life, his accident, through the Rodney Rogers Foundation, which he operates with his wife, Faye, who is here with him this evening. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, mayor of the city of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim October 17th, 2017, as Rodney Rogers Day in Durham, in appreciation of his basketball career and his service to the city of Durham. By the way, tomorrow, Tuesday, October the 17th, is the beginning of the NBA season. And it is signed, witness my hand and the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this 16th day of October 2017, and is signed by Mayor William V. Bill Bell. surprise at this, but um, it's a great thing, and uh, Mayor Bell, I appreciate that, and I um, appreciate all my friends and family here, especially my wife and her sister being here, and um, it's just a, a great appreciation, you know, from your hometown that, uh, you know, they really you know, thought that you did some good things and stuff for him, and uh, I really appreciate it. So. 
Thank you so much, Rodney. Thank you for being here. Um, before we leave, I would like to recognize some of the people uh, from the class of 1990 at Hillside High School who are here. Could you still, could you stand, please? Yeah. He's talking. <laughs> he can still stand. <laughs> And, and could you still remain standing, and could we ask anyone else who is here who is a graduate of Hillside High School to please stand? Oh, so oh yeah, go for it. And could you remain standing, and could we ask if there is anyone from the city of Durham who worked at the city of Durham when Rodney was working with you? <laughs> And finally, if there's anyone who graduated from Wake Forest University, <laughs> uh, Patrick, Patrick Baker would, would have been, been here. here, but he is away at a conference. But he, I'm sure, uh, would want to contact you. I think he has said that he's going to give you a call. OK. Thank you so much, Rodney. You're our hero, Roger. Rodney, you are. Uh, well, <laughs> you, you, you've done it, and uh, you, you make us proud. And uh, you, it's our honor to have you here this evening to present this. And, well, we, we, we appreciate you. Trust me. Trust me. I, I remember when. You do. <laughs> do it well. Um, we we have two other proclamations to make this evening, and again, I, I don't want anyone to feel they have to stay. Uh, we understand people have busy schedules, so feel free to leave as you see fit. This next proclamation <clears throat> recognizes Lead Safe Certified Renovation Day, and I'd like to ask Ms. Lenora Smith. You would join me. Where's Lenore? Okay. <laughs> How you doing? Uh, Lenora has been involved in this program, it seems like, forever. forever. Uh, she participates in the TNT, the Reduction in Poverty effort that we have going on in the city of Durham and northeast central Durham. Uh, the proclamation reads, whereas childhood lead poisoning is considered a completely preventable environmental disease among young children, where there is no safe blood level, blood lead level in children that have been, has been identified, whereas lead exposure usually occurs with no obvious symptoms, it frequently goes unrecognized, whereas the state of North Carolina enacted public health laws establishing the lead-based paint hazard management program for renovation, repair, and painting in 2009, protect children from preventable lead-based paint poisoning from renovation activities conducted in housing and child-occupied facilities built before 1978, whereas laws require that companies and individuals become certified by the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services Division by Public Health, Health Hazard, and Control Unit before performing renovation, repair, and painting activities for compensation Whereas the County of Durham recognizes the National Lead Poisoning Prevention Week, 
commends contractors that have received certification to implement the lead safe work practices necessary to protect our most valuable resource in Durham, our children. Whereas in recognition of the National Lead Poisoning Prevention Week, the County of Durham encourages contractors who have not already done so to become certified and protect our children from lead dust exposure and to award fines up to $5,000 today for each violation. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bell Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim October 24, 2017, is Lead Safe Certified Renovators Day in Durham, and hereby commend this observance to all of Durham. Witness my hand, Corporate Seal of the City of Durham. This is the 16th day of October 2017, and I'm going to present this to Lenora for any comments that she may have. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, city council members and friends of um, the community. The partnership effort for the advancement of children's health has been here since 1999. Um, I think we received our initial funding at that time. Um, and that is actually when I was introduced to lead-based paint, the hazards associated with it, especially to, to children under the age of six. Basically, lead um, disrupts every developmental um, factor associated with children. Children, as they, it slows down their um, learning ability, their attention span, they have behavior problems. And for this reason, we're looking at protecting children from unnecessary and preventable, 100% preventable exposure to lead-based paint hazards and lead dust. I would just like to mention that two years ago, we received a proclamation from the city, and that proclamation basically highlighted the law um, that stated contractors need to be certified. At that time, Ms. Effie Steele was here with me. She accepted the um, proclamation with me. And we lost Ms. Steele um, earlier this year in um, August. And so um, I just want to mention her name and recognize the help and the support and the, um, the very solid leader she was for the Peach organization. Um, I'd like to say thank you to city um, staff. I don't know if Ted New is here, but she's been very instrumental in the work that we do. I want to thank uh, Council Member McFadden and Council Mem Member Davis for um, helping us to draft the proclamation. I do want to um, let Council know that on Tuesday, October 24th, from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock, we will host a lead town hall meeting. It will be held at Holton um, Community Resource, um, the Resource, Career and Resource Center, 401 North Driver Street. Um, it will be from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. We will provide uh, nutritious and hearty dinner. And we will also provide child care for members of the community who would like to attend but may have small children. Um, and so um, we just thank you for totally, for continually to work with us and for recognizing us at this time. And if I may, because this is probably my last time to say thank you to the mayor for his service to the community through the city and through the county and through the community development um, UDI Community Development Corps. And I would just say, I am a resident that benefited from the housing, the initial housing drive in downtown Durham. I rent um, office space from UDI in downtown Durham, very affordable. So I just wanted to mention that um, while you're going, I wanted to say thank you for your service as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That was not a paid advertisement. I <laughs> appreciate it. Very good, though. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Community Planning Month, and we'd like to ask our Director of Planning, Patrick Young, if he would join me. Where it's change is constant and affects all cities, towns, suburbs, counties, urban, and rural areas. Where it's community planning and plans can help manage this change in a way that provides better choices for how people work and live. 
Whereas a key component of community planning is the involvement of all of Durham citizens in making choices that determine the future quality of life in Durham. Whereas the full benefits of planning requires public officials and citizens who understand, support, and demand excellence in planning and plan implementation. Whereas the month of October is designated as National Community Planning Month throughout the United States of America and its territory. And whereas the American Planning Association and its professional institute, the American Institute of Certified Planners, endorsed National Community Planning Month as an opportunity to highlight the contributions planning makes to the quality of our community and environment, whereas the celebration of National Community Planning Month gives us the opportunity to publicly recognize the participation and dedication of the members of Durham's appointed and elected boards and commissions and other citizen planners who have contributed their time and expertise to improvement of the city and county of Durham, North Carolina, whereas we recognize the many valuable contributions made by professional planners the Durham City County Planning Department and extend our heartfelt thanks for the continued commitment to public service by these professionals. And therefore, I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the month of October 2017 as Community Planning Month in the City of Durham, North Carolina, in conjunction with the celebration of National Community Planning Month. With my hand, Corpus Hill, City of Durham, North Carolina. This is the 16th of October 2017. I'm going to present this to Patrick for any comments that you may have. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. And on behalf of the planning department staff and the 60 plus citizen planners that you all have appointed to boards and commissions to advise you on planning matters, uh, we appreciate the um, recognition of this honor, this, the honor of this resolution. Uh, community planning is about making community more livable. And with your leadership and support, we've been able to do that. And we, I think we do more so every year. Our three top priorities for this year are to engage with the community, and mostly means listening, but also teaching, uh, to give back to the community, and to work on programs that ensure that Durham remains accessible for all. Uh, towards that end, we have two exciting events coming up. Next Friday, the 27th, we have an event called the Monster Dash, which is a, a fun run, Councilmember Shul, um, that will be held at the American Tobacco Trail, uh, Trailhead at Blackwell Street at 5 p.m., uh, and that's co-sponsored with the Parks and Recreation Department, and uh, Budget Management Services, and all proceeds will go to the Independent Animal Rescue of Durham. And on the 30th of October, Monday, uh, one of our rare Mondays off, we'll have um, a open house at the Planning Department from 4 to 6 p.m. And that's an opportunity for all in the community to come meet the planners and, and see what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and get any questions they may have answered. So thanks again for your support of community planning. Entertain any comments that members of the council may have? <coughs> Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yes, sir. Um, coming. So uh, I just want to take a moment and say, as I'm sure most people know, last Tuesday we held a primary here in Durham for three city council and the mayor's seats. And the purpose of the primary is to narrow the number of candidates for each race to two for the general election, which is November 7th. We had eight winners on Tuesday, and I want to congratulate all eight winners for the work they've done, the campaigns they ran, and the passion to serve. Each of the four races comes with one vote on city council, as we all know, and they are each important. I hope that people will take the time to study the eight candidates and make their own decisions based on the candidates' merits. When people decide to form a city, they do so in order to provide services like water and sewer, streets, trash and recycling and public safety. Durham does a great job of providing these services efficiently. Such a good job, in fact, that they are not issues during this campaign. That is a credit to this council, to the council members who served in the recent past, and to our administration. But we should not take it for granted. Doing the work of the city takes all of us together. It's been an honor and a privilege to serve the people of Durham for these past five years. And to the four people who prevail in November, I wish great success for their tenure and for our beloved Bull City. Also, I want to welcome the scouts tonight. I got a little nostalgic. I spent a lot of years in scouting um, as a, 
uh, through the different ranks um, as a patrol leader, a senior patrol leader, Order of the Arrow, and even Eagle Scout. I'm still very proud that I'm an Eagle Scout today. So welcome, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, Don, we appreciate your remarks. Um, more importantly, we appreciate your service. Uh, we, it's been a pleasure and a privilege to serve with you. And of course, we've got a few more weeks to go, but right. uh, we, I know you worked that out as we move forward. Right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Any other comments? If not, we'll move with the agenda. Let me ask, are there prior times by the city manager? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening, members of council. Uh, this evening, I would request at the uh, conclusion of the council meeting that uh, council go into a brief closed session to consider the performance of an individual public officer or employee pursuant to North Carolina General Statutes 143.318.11A8. Uh, like Excuse me, yes. A6, pardon me. Been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Yeah. Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Uh, you have a That's it, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Recognize Deputy City Attorney, uh, Assistant City Attorney, uh, the yeah. acting. <laughs> for now, I'm Fred Lamar. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There are no priority items uh, from the city attorney's office. <coughs> Likewise, recognize the city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we'll proceed with the agenda. Uh, first item being the consent agenda. And as you know, consent agenda can be approved with a single vote if a member of the council or member of the audience removes a consent agenda item. We will discuss that item later in the agenda. I'll just read the heading of each one of the, the consent agenda items. Uh, on the Durham City County Insurance <coughs> Commission appointment, item three is street and infrastructure acceptances. Item five is a resolution granting consent to Wake Electric Membership Corporation to serve as the exclusive provider of electric services to area assigned to Wake Electric Membership Corporation by the North Carolina Utilities Commission. Item six is establishment of permit process <coughs> and fees for dockless bike share operation. Item seven is a contract with Midwest Bus Corporation to repower up to 25 hybrid buses. Item eight is a grant agreement for Duke Beltline Trail. Item nine is the FY 2018 agreement with North Carolina State University for support of the Triangle Regional Model Development Enhancement and Maintenance. Item 10 is a contract for reconditioning of biosolids dewatering equipment, North Durham Water Reclamation Facility. Item 11 is on-call professional services, master service agreements. Item 12 is West Safety Services, telephone contract extension. Item 13 is the res resolution authorizing city auction on October 21st, 2017. Item 14 is August 2017 bid report. Item 15 is state contract purchase for replacement vehicles for the Durham Police Department. Item 16 is cooperative purchase group purchase for three fire trucks for the Durham Fire Department. Item 17 is annual U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Fair Housing Case Processing Grant. Item 18 is 2018 Financial Crimes Task Force Grant Project Ordinance. Item 19 is 2018 Police Athletic League Program Grant Project Ordinance. Item 20 is the 2018 Blue Benevolence Grant Project Ordinance. Item 21 is 2017 Halloween Grant Project Ordinance. Hmm. Item 22 is second quarter 17 Technology Innovation for Public Safety Program Grant. Item 23 is an ordinance, revision to city code sections 70 95, 70 96, and 70 129. Item 23 is an item that can be found on the general business agenda. 25. That's item 25. Oh, 25, I'm sorry. It says 26 on my books. It's 26. Items 26 through 28 are items that can be found on the general business agenda in public hearings. Entertain a motion for the approval of the consent agenda. I recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yes, sir. Before, before we, I just had one question about item 23, which was the revision to the city code sections um, giving 
um, authority to the city manager for utility extension agreements. There was one change that I had requested having to do with um, use of property having come back to council. If the use changed, then it would come to council for further approval. Did that get, did that get included in the item? Yes, sir, that change has been made and it will also be included in each and every agreement. Great, thank you. Thank you. I'll move the, the consent agenda. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Got it. Uh, we move to the general business agenda. Uh, item 25 is proposed Jackson Pettigrew Street development update. Mayor Bell, members of city council, uh, Reginald Johnson, director of the Department of Community Development. The item before you, uh, number 25, the proposed Jackson Pettigrew Street development update is actually a joint item from the Community Development Department as well as the Office of Economic and Workforce Development. Uh, we did have extensive discussion at the work session, I would call your attention to the questions that you council asked that were provided a written response uh, to the you that were, was in your, included in your packet. I would emphasize for tonight that the most important thing is that uh, the city council provide the uh, administration with direction uh, in terms of which option we want to pursue. And that is important because uh, because of the time, na timely nature of preparing the application and the detailed work that needs to go into that, we need to uh, have a decision tonight, uh, if at, at all possible, so that we can move forward. Uh, how we will proceed tonight, uh, uh, Bricka Eklund, Ms. Bricka Eklund from Self Help, will briefly share the uh, how the options were developed, and Mr. Michael Rogers of DHIC will provide uh, some discussion on the financial aspects, and then we'll be prepared to answer any questions. Great. Before you begin, are there any questions by members of the council? Mm. If not. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council members, Rick Eklund, Director of Real Estate at Self Help. Um, quickly to overview, just to remind the council and the members of the public where we were at at work session, uh, the development team is Self Help Ventures Fund in partnership with DHIC, a very well-known and renowned affordable housing developer out of Raleigh. And over the last uh, three months since we received our last direction from City Council in early June, we've been working with a number of partners to be able to bring to you several design concepts uh, for direction to move forward tonight. And again, the, uh, the goal here is to have your preferred development concept so that we can move forward uh, with much more uh, detailed analysis. To summarize, uh, we're bringing four concepts to you tonight, and they're really broken up into two scenarios, each of which have two options. Um, the first is scenario A, which has two options, A1 and A2. We uh, viewed this as the, um, our response to the council's request um, for your RFQ that was released in October of last year, and which Self-Help Ventures Fund and DHIC were awarded at the beginning of this year. Uh, we were asked to bring a residential affordable housing uh, component that would have some market rate units, structured parking, and retail. And so we'll be presenting two options for that to you, one of which has approximately 101 units, uh, which has 80 affordable uh, units to individuals at 60% of area median income and below, um, as well as around 21 uh, market rate units. We also have another concept that is just the affordable units themselves at 80 units. Uh, we'll also bring to you two concepts under what we're calling Scenario B, which is both the affordable housing and market rate components, um, as well as building out the rest of the site with what we are proposing as a Class A office space, uh, three-story office building. Um, both scenario, All four scenarios have structured parking, either one level or two levels, depending on the density of the site as well as commercial space, retail space, which again also uh, grows with the build out of the full site. So to walk through the four components for you, the first concept is A1. Um, this is a design that the design team has been working on with Klein Design out of Raleigh. And to just draw your attention to the orange building, uh, this is the residential component. Um, in this design, the building is a little larger. It would be 101 units again, 80 of which would be affordable, 
Uh, LIHTC here it refers to the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, which is the mechanism we propose to work through uh, this, this process, and having approximately 21 market rate units. Um, this design does not have office. What's marked as future development is more so of an unused portion. Uh, this is approximately half an acre. We'd have to work through the, the specific details on this, um, but we are proposing that this, uh, if this concept went forward, that would remain a vacant parcel um, to, to, for future use. Uh, we would have to have at least one-to-one -one parking spaces, one unit. Each unit would need a parking space, and that would be unstructured parking underneath uh, the residential building. Um, the residential building would also have retail on the first floor as well as a uh, retail building that would sit up on West Chapel Hill Street closer to the existing Durham Transit Station. The second concept is very similar. It's just a smaller residential building, similar structured parking, similar retail space. Um, but we're proposing in this one that we would only use only have affordable units, again, um, at 60% of area median income and below. But the general uh, design of the built of the, the entire approximately two acre site would remain the same. Moving to the, the second overall concept, which again also has two options. Uh, this is the one that the design team proposes to uh, take up the entire site. Um, for reasons that Michael Rogers uh, will talk more about, uh, we really see only approximately 80 units, maybe a few more being appropriate for this site. And so building out the entire site with affordable housing um, becomes difficult under uh, state um, and financing challenges. So in order to fully maximize the entire site and the density of the site, um, in our second concept, we're proposing building a three-story Class A office building um, on the southeastern portion of the site. And just for reference, uh, this is at the intersection um, towards the uh, north deck for American Tobacco and the uh, University Ford, uh, Ford property. The concept here is that uh, both buildings would be on top of a two-story structured parking structure also with uh, retail uh, space on the first floor, um, providing um, great connectivity and urban design, uh, meeting er uh, UDO requirements for the city, and uh, again, fully building out the site. Here we would have approximately 54,000 square feet of office space uh, rented at market rates, and we'd be looking at closer to, to 260 parking spaces that we believe we would be able to fill, uh, use to fill this entire site. The second concept is, again, the smaller residential building, strictly affordable housing. This is concept B2. This would allow us to have a larger office building, uh, approximately 62,000 square feet of office space, uh, that we would again rent at market rates and would allow us to, to build out the site um, with even greater density on that, that portion of the property. So unless, if anyone has questions on concepts, otherwise I'll hand it over to Michael Rogers to walk through the numbers. Mr. Mayor, I had a couple of quick questions. Um, first of all, thank you. Appreciate you laying that out and very clearly denoting the differences in the scenarios. I had a question that a member of the public uh, addressed to me over social media um, last week, having to do with the location of the playground. Mm -hmm. um, and is it, um, are we required by some kind of city regulation or code um, to, to have the edge of the building match up with the lines of the street, or could we flip the location of the playground to get it um, on the other side of the building? And the reason I ask is this resident was concerned about having the playground so close to um, the area of the bus terminal where uh, buses are idling. Um, and so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer the, the piece on where it's currently located, and then if, if there is a member of planning who would want to speak about the the street frontage, just to make sure I don't misspeak. Um, the, the, just so everyone is aware, that plaza is actually an elevated plaza. Um, if you think that the, the buildings have to be on top of two stories of podium parking, and so if, I'm not sure if this points, but ah. um, there, are, there would be steps going up above the two levels of podium parking, and this would actually be an elevated plaza, okay. and it would actually be an elevated playground. Uh -huh. So you still would have the overlook onto Durham Transit, but in terms of any sort of safety concerns, uh, I think we're looking at approximately 30-ish feet above grade 
um, that that plaza would be elevated. And so we, there'd be screenage around landscaping and, and pieces like that, but it would not be an at-grade connection to the transit station. I think I, the resident was less concerned about the, uh, the possibility that a child might be interact with a bus in some dangerous way, but that the fumes from the idling buses would, would come into the play area and was wondering why the playground couldn't be flipped to the other side to put the building in between. Pat Young with the planning department. Um, the part of the design intent of the downtown design district is to activate the street by having the buildings close to the street. So the majority of the frontage would have to be along Jackson Street, but it is at least conceptually possible that um, a portion of, of the, there could be a portion of the frontage that was set back to accommodate essentially what you're suggesting, flip-flopping um, the location of the park or the plaza and, and the building. Of course, that may have other knock-on impacts, as I, as I think Britta just described, in terms of cost and feasibility. But it, but over 60% of the frontage has to be within 15 feet of the of the right-of-way. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, that was all I had, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. Look forward to the opportunity to walk you through some of our development numbers here. Uh, before we go through the individual scenarios, just to mention a few uh, features that apply. Introduce yourself. Oh, I'm sorry, Michael Rogers, <coughs> DHIC. Thank you. Um, first of all, this applies to all of the uh, all of the scenarios. In each one, we've included 80 units of affordable housing. Bricka mentioned that that uh, is not set in stone, uh, but that was done based on the current first draft of the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency's qualified allocation plan for how they determine the competitiveness of the tax credits. So in determining that, uh, they use a ratio referred to as the credits per unit that's weighed very closely and oftentimes, as was the case in 2017, is often the determining factor for which applications in a very competitive program are actually awarded tax credits. So in looking at what the available tax credits were in the first draft of the Qualified Allocation Plan, we determined based on that maximum of 900,000 as a project-specific max that 80 units would be the most competitive uh, range of affordable units we could provide. As we move forward and the Housing Finance Agency refines that qualified sorry, allocation just, plan. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Councilman Stewart has a question. <coughs> Mike, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No problem. Um, just want to understand a little bit. I read the memo, uh, <coughs> the second memo y'all provided. Thank you. But I just want to make sure I understand this. First of all, is the 900,000 credits, is, that's a project specific maximum that you, is that what you said? Yes, sir. And is that is that for any project? Is that like the most you can get? Yes, sir. Okay. And so the, what I'm trying to understand is the, is the credit per unit average and kind of how you, how you back into that, so to speak. You know, how do you compute that? I, I know that there's a, um, the other metros are all putting in what they think their, 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 the credit per unit average is going to be as well as we are. Is that right? That, that's correct. And so to what extent do we know, you know, so it's to some extent we're just estimating. We're doing our best guess. That, that's, very, uh, that's very accurate. And last year was the first year that they used the range to determine it instead of a lowest credits per unit. So this, it really was, you know, for all intents and purposes, a black box and a guessing game of, of which was going to be the average. And so is the range gonna be what is being used this year or is it gonna be the lowest? It will not be the lowest. They are, they are proposing a change to how that would work. And so we'll be in the same predicament in 2018 that we were in 2017 of making our best effort 
to determine what that average is going to be. Can you explain me what the rational basis for that is? I mean, I don't understand why that's the system. In other words, why should there be a system where each of the metros is essentially trying to have to guess the credits per unit average? I, I cannot purport to explain the rationale of the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency on that. Okay. So there, do they have, do they purport to explain their own rational basis or? Uh, there's not a, a strong defense of that rationale. Um, okay. And I think it's a continually evolving system to find what is both a transparent process uh, and rewards the most competitive applications. And so, but our, our, your, your experience in, from DHI, so your experience at, let's just say, guessing or estimating what this average, the ability to come close to the average is really important for our ability to get the project done, no matter which of these scenarios we choose. Yes, sir. And you're, you have experience at DHIC in being able to make these estimates and do them pretty well. With, with reasonable accuracy. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, it's, it was a mystery to me even if I read, after I read the memo a couple times, so I appreciate that it's somewhat a mystery to you too. Thank you. It's, <laughs> it's a moving target, if you will, uh, and just to give you an example, that average of credits per unit in 2016 was 7,900, and in 2017 was 10,900. So it's a guessing game that we're all playing and doing our best to, uh, with a reasonable degree of certainty. Well, what caused what other, that variation? Uh, part of it was the change in how that rule was done in the QAP, the Qualified Allocation Plan. Um, part of it was a recognition from the uh, Housing Finance Agency of the rising cost of construction and the feasibility of building these projects the way that they are being represented at the application stage. Is there any talk of the metros getting together and saying ahead of time, hey, here's what our average is going to be, here's what your average is going to be? I mean, you know, isn't, isn't there some rationale for that in the sense that that way the, 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 the decisions about the tax credit allocation would be made on other than, on a basis other than who has the best guess as to what the average might end up being? That would be a conceivable thing to do with the 2017 rule. The proposed draft rule for 2018, I think, is an attempt to circumvent that. Uh, we have not really wrapped our heads yet around how exactly to approach that as it just was released um, going forward. That's something that I think everybody will look at, and I would encourage uh, the members of the council to contact the Housing Finance Agency with any feedback that you have on the system. I think they are always looking for comments uh, from members of the public, from developers, from representatives of city government to help determine what is going to be the most effective system for fairly and transparently allocating these credits across the state. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, thank you for letting me travel down that rabbit hole a little bit, uh, but uh, it, it, I appreciate your answers, Mike. It's a very deep rabbit hole. Thank you very much. So if, if, I, if I may, um, the other factors that apply uh, to all scenarios beyond the 80 units, as I said, that was based on the first draft of the Qualified Allocation Plan, and we will be continually refining our development plan as the agency is closer to releasing their final tax credit allocation plan. Um, along those same lines, as we move forward with design and have more certainty as to site plans, unit plans, architectural treatments for the facade, we are continually refining costs and we'll be able to get more and more <coughs> accurate as we move forward with uh, what, what is going to apply and be a reasonably accurate uh, estimation of a final cost. With those uh, kind of all-encompassing points, I'll move on to go through the nuts and bolts of Concept A-1. Concept A-1 is mm -hmm. what we understood as our best representation of the specifications of the request for qualifications that was released in 2016. It includes mixed income with 
80 affordable units, structured parking, <coughs> and retail space, wrapping that parking compliant with the UDO standards. Uh, we worked with the planning department in doing that to make sure that what we were designing um, both fit <coughs> their standards and fit with what we understood our charge to be. Um, I'll note in looking at this where you see retail, uh, that we are only including the costs from the retail shell. We're not included full tenant upfit costs. Reason for this is a nuance of, of affordable housing tax credits in that the traditional lenders and investors of these deals will not allow you to show income on retail space without a signed pre-lease agreement. So without that agreement in place, we've represented only the costs that it would take to build out that space with any for, uh, tenant upfit costs being done in the future to accommodate any tenants that would lease that space. Looking at the details of this chart, and uh, this applies to all charts going forward, what we've done is laid out at the top the total sources for the residential and the total development cost for the res residential, which produces that first dark blue line. That's our residential only gap. Uh, below that, we've added in, yes, Mr. Mayor. I, I'm just, because <clears throat> you're presenting this to us, but the general public is seeing it also. <clears throat> so I think it would be helpful, even if it takes a little time, as you go through the line items and the columns to maybe give a little bit more detail. When you talk about total sources, what does that include? When you talk about total development costs, what does that include? <clears throat> Sir, so as far as total sources go, uh, there are really um, two conventional sources on an affordable housing <coughs> project. The first comes from the low-income housing tax credits that we've discussed. Those tax credits are essentially purchased by a tax credit syndicator. So we get from that purchase of tax credits equity up front to use to build the project. The second That's source, the 900,000. Excuse me? That's the 900,000? Uh, on this project, yes, it would be the 900,000 okay. over 10 years for a total of 9 million in credits. Um, you then apply a tax credit price to that, which on this project with our current assumptions results in a little over $8 million in tax credit equity. Beyond that, the other main source would be a conventional debt that would be used to build a residential project. Uh, this can come in a few different forms, whether it's directly from a bank or done through Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, um, or uh, FHA. We've used all different manners of loan programs on these projects, and as we move forward, we'd be looking to see what was the best fit uh, with re the requirements and the nature of this project to deliver the best terms for the deal. Um, beyond that, there are a number of soft sources that are often provided from cities, counties, or other grant programs that um, may be available. And we've worked with any number of different sources and structures uh, to really build out and cover the gap in the projects that we've worked on. Turning to development costs. Well, I, I guess what, what I want, want to emphasize, what you're showing are strictly the costs for developing the project. You aren't showing the resultant rents that you would get from the affordable units and et cetera to make it sustainable. Those, those costs are not in here. They're, they're not represented. I have, I have that material. But I'm saying they, they are not a part of the $12 million that we're talking about. We're strictly talking about the cost of developing the yes. building the construction. Yes, okay. At some point in time, you're going to tell us what rents you need to sustain this project. Uh, if you don't do it now, I'd like to see it. Yes, I'd be happy to provide that information. I know um, city staff has reviewed some of that information as well. So when, whenever convenient, I'd be more than happy to provide and review that with anybody that would like to see it. Um, on the actual development costs for the project, we're really looking at a, a wide range of, of costs. The simplest are the uh, site work and the actual bricks and sticks, the, the costs of building the project. Um, beyond that, we have a number of costs. The, the land cost is not in this number, oh, is it? The land cost is, no. It, in, it's in, not in there, right? In our assumptions, the, the land cost was provided. Okay. <clears throat> 
beyond, beyond the actual cost of building, we look at a number of different things. Um, obviously, the architectural fees and engineering fees that go into uh, building out and providing the feasibility and design services for a project like this. Uh, there are also a number of <laughs> financing costs that go along with the permanent mortgage and the construction financing, uh, both origination fees, interest during construction, um, and legal fees that go along with the closing and recording of those types of documents. Uh, the tax credit program also carries a few costs that are based on percentages of the total eligible basis or depreciable basis, um, and as, as well as uh, percentages of the units and the total tax credit amount. So a number of those change depending on the amount of tax credits that you request. Uh, in this particular instance, those are the same across almost all scenarios due to the nature of the similarity of these projects. Uh, below that residential only gap, which is the balance of our development costs and sources, we have the, the costs that we consider unique to this project that you would not see as a part of a typical low-income housing tax credit project. Uh, uh, for that, we're, we're looking at the cost of building out the structured parking, the plaza space that's on top of that podium, um, and the retail shell that's wrapping it uh, with a little bit of additional contingency that would be required by lenders and investors to provide some certainty that there were not going to be significant cost overruns. Um, on this concept A1, uh, we're looking, as I said, at the retail shell um, and we're looking at providing parking on a one-to-one -one, uh, basis for all units. Looking at the overall numbers, you'll see that this is the largest uh, financing gap of all four scenarios. We're looking at a financing gap of roughly 8.1 million or $80,000 per unit. Uh, there's a large difference in the sources as you look at this and to the right of the, uh, of the table, you'll see that there's a breakout of the affordable versus the market rate costs. The, the large difference in sources here is because while the market rate units support a larger share of conventional debt, they are not eligible for any low-income housing tax credits. So that eight-plus million dollars in equity is borne entirely by the affordable units. So that feeds into the gap that you see um, at on those dark blue lines, a significant difference between what the gap is attributable to the affordable units versus attributable to the market rate. As we move down and we look beyond those costs that are unique to this project, we have two lines, the gap without vouchers and then the gap with vouchers. As we've worked through this, we've been working with the Durham Housing Authority to provide project-based vouchers, a conversion of Section 8 vouchers uh, for this project. The, in this instance, there are 26, we are assuming 26 project-based vouchers. The reason it's 26 is because we have those, we've assumed that those are assigned to the units that would be uh, reserved for people making 30% or less of the area median income. We've included 25% and this applies to all scenarios, 25% of all affordable units will be reserved for people making 30% of the area median income or less. We do that for two reasons. One, as mission-based nonprofits, we're dedicated to providing that deeper targeting, and we want to have units that are affordable to those people. Two, that's we're aiming for the to achieve the maximum scoring in the qualified allocation plan and are providing the deepest level of targeting to achieve that score. Can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. It's just, just a minor point, but when, you, when I read the document and you said 25% of the units were reserved for people making 30%, 
one fourth of 80 is 20 units, not 26. So what, what, what am I missing? <clears throat> it's 25% it's of the total units in the tax credit application. Well, I thought of the total units we were talking about was 80? It's 20, 25% of the 101. Of the 101? Yes, sir. That's why on the following, on A2, we are assuming 20 vouchers because it's just the 80 units. Okay. The 25% of the 101 is uh, what, what we're calling 26 here. So e even though the additional 21 are market rate units, as far as the total project, is, you're looking at as 101 units, and you're looking at 25% of that number? Yes, sir. Okay. So what, what the project-based vouchers would allow us to do is to achieve a higher rental income with the tenants paying, <coughs> excuse me, a lower <coughs> and the voucher making up the difference. That translates to a much much greater uh, first mortgage on the project. And on the concepts with 101 units would equate to roughly a, a $1.2 million reduction in that gap. So look, looking at our total gaps on concept A1, uh, without the vouchers, we're at 8.1 million. With those vouchers, you're a little over 6.9 million or uh, around 68 and a half thousand per unit. Recognize Councilman Shul. Mike, just to, this question relates to something that the mayor was asking about earlier. So I think of the vouchers as supporting the people's income as they're renting, right? Yes. So why is that a reduction of capital costs? So that would say, and I'll just use hypothetical numbers here, if the Durham Housing Authority decided that the cap for a, a project-based voucher rent was $800, but the rent for a 30% area median income unit was $300, that voucher would provide the difference, that $500 difference. So when we underwrite the deal and apply for our tax credits and for our mortgages, we'd be able to show an income from that unit of 800, even though the tenant's responsibility for that would only be 300. I see, so you, it's because you know that you have the vouchers that that changes the, what you're able to get underwritten. Yes, sir, and it's because they're project-based uh, yeah. versus tenant-based. Okay, thank you. So if I could, I'd move on to A2, which is essentially, if you remember the site plan, the same concept as A1, um, but with a smaller residential building without the 21 market rate units. <coughs> this is our second highest uh, financial gap, owing to some of the principles that we just went through. Um, the reason, obviously, that a2 is a smaller gap is because with a one-to-one -one parking ratio, our parking costs are lower and the podium is a little bit smaller. Accordingly, the retail shell that is wrapping the parking is also smaller due to the decreased podium size. The same principles apply to the logic of this table, um, save for the fact that you don't see the affordable versus market breakout to the right owing to that it's 100% affordable. The total gap is reduced from A1 uh, by about 1.75 million before those vouchers. Um, the total gap before the vouchers in A2 is 6.4 million, or roughly 80,000 per unit, with 20 project-based vouchers on this, which would lead to about a $920,000 reduction of that gap our total gap after those vouchers is 5.5 million, uh, or roughly 68,000 per unit. Can I ask a question about the? Uh, yes, sir. The retail shell, and the, in each of the scenarios, it it talks about, um, or at least in the first couple, that if you had the pre-lease of the retail shell, that that would. You're, 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 you're assuming that there would no be pre, no pre-lease of the retail shell, and hence the cost that you have of a million dollars or whatever it is for, for that construction. That's correct. And so 
but you're putting it in there in a way to say that, I mean, the expectation, would it have to be fully leased to, to, re, to recapture that? And would it recapture all of that? It would, it would depend on what rents were agreed to in any sort of lease agreement. Um, if there was a strong lease agreement that lasted for a significant amount of time, and that amount of time would have to be approved by the agency as well as any investors and lenders that were going to underwrite the deal, conceivably you would be able to show some amount of income uh, that would offset some of those costs. Now, if we were to do that, we would also carry um, tenant upfit costs that we do not have represented in here. So I offhand don't have a number of what that amount of offset would be. But yes, theoretically, there, there would be a reduction in that. Let, let me, Steve, would you finish? Yes, sir. Uh, the, the bottom line of this, this chart <clears throat> and all the charts, you're going to show us that you have a gap of $4 million, whatever it is. And my question is, given the time frame of construction and your overall plan <clears throat> for this project, when would you need the gap money? Is this something you need right up front or something you need over a period of time? What, 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 what how does that show? So as, as we move forward, the first major deadline for the team would be the preliminary tax credit application, which is due in mid-January. Um, prior to that, we would like to have a, a tentative commitment with an up-to amount um, so that we would be confident moving into that with a full commitment with terms, uh, full terms for how that subsidy would work prior to the May 2018 full application date. Let, let me ask it another way. Well, I think I can. Um, Go ahead. So beyond that, if we were to receive an award, we would receive that in August and we begin setting everything in place. Funding in, from the city as subsidy would not be required until the full construction, financing, and equity closing that would happen probably at the, at the beginning or uh, early in 2019. So I, I guess I'm trying to determine, even given that, is there any way these payments could be made over a certain period of time? In other words, it's one thing to say you need $4.5 million, $4.3 million from the city. Uh, does the city have to come up with that in one lump sum at a certain period of time? Is that $4 million that can be stretched over five, ten years or something like that? It, it would be needed during the period of construction so that it was available at the point where the construction loan was taken out and we mm -hmm. converted to a permanent debt. Okay, so it's almost like a construction loan that you're talking about you would need from us. Okay. Yes, sir. Right. Mr. Mayor, I asked that exact same question at the work session. Okay. I was, I was hoping for the same thing. <laughs> okay, okay. I love the work session, but thank you. Go ahead. Well, if I, if I may, I'll move on to uh, B1. So concept B1, as uh, Bricka laid out, is our 101 units mixed income with retail and the smaller office building. Uh, this is our third highest gap, um, and the office piece is helpful in a number of different ways. So the first and foremost, I mentioned the difficulty of underwriting that retail cost. That's a difficulty for low-income housing tax credit projects, but it is not the same difficulty for a conventional office or commercial project. Mike, you, you've bored the Boy Scouts. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Thank you, gentlemen. Just trying to make sure they're prepared. <laughs> Um, so I, as I mentioned, the, the office would be able to absorb the cost of the, the retail. And in fact, when we've put this scenario together, as well as B2, we've also assumed those tenant upfit costs because they're able to show that income. Uh, second, having the office share the site allows the office to also share in some of the costs of the transaction. Uh, these can range from a number of different things. Looking at construction costs, they can clearly share in the site costs that go into the site development. 
uh, the cost of constructing the parking <coughs> structure, third party fees uh, like geotechnical and environmental analysis, as well as some other costs that apply to the deal. So that, that's a, a big help in absorbing some of the costs that in concept A um, are, are borne solely by the residential. Uh, it also serves as a reduction of the re, uh, residential development costs um, by absorbing uh, some of the other fees. The total, what we've looked at in that residential cost line is roughly uh, 615,000. And then when you look be below at the absorption of the retail costs, that's an additional reduction of the burden on the residential of about 1.4 million. Um, so you can see that that's, it's clearly a benefit in cost allocations. Um, additionally, the office, <coughs> in the underwriting of it, produces a surplus of funds. Uh, you can see that in the line entitled Office Retail Contribution in this table below GAP, including parking. Uh, that surplus of funds could be provided as an additional subsidy or as absorption of um, additional costs by the office and retail uh, use. Looking at the difference from our previous scenarios, um, the total gap has decreased from scenario A1 by roughly 2.6 million. The residential only gap here after the parking um, and transfer slab and the additional contingency is roughly 6.1 million uh, or 60,000 per unit. Moving beyond that and incorporating what's been estimated as a potential contribution from the office and retail, we're looking at a total gap before vouchers of about 5.6 million or 55,000 per unit. Um, and after the vouchers, and in this scenario, we're looking at the 26 project-based vouchers, that gap further decreases to 4.4 million or around $44,000 per unit. We've also taken a look at current millage rates and what an estimated value of that office and retail use would be to show that uh, roughly 5.1 million in tax revenues would be created over 15 years. The reason we used 15 years is because that's the uh, standard compliance period for an affordable housing deal. I have a question. Sure. Like the office retail contribution, how is that calculated? So the way that was calculated is um, putting together a development model using the office and retail rents to determine uh, what the net operating income of that project would be and then using that to size the debt that would be payable and the equity that would be paid um, by the office and retail project. In, in an ability, the project would have the ability to um, build it with a smaller permanent loan, but using the debt sizing produced by the operating income assumptions that we've made would allow it to take on a larger share of debt and use, and that would create a, essentially a surplus of funds. Thanks. Moving on finally to concept B2. Uh, this is the 80 unit affordable only um, with retail and a larger office. So this is our lowest overall subsidy amount. Um, the gap here has been reduced by up to 4.1 million, including contribution from office and that voucher number. Um, the residential gap in this scenario is about 4.6 million or 57,000 per unit. Looking at without vouchers, we're down to about 3.7 million or 47,000 per unit. And the total gap, assuming 20 property <coughs> vouchers here is uh, roughly 2.8 million or 35,000 per unit. And looking at the total tax value over 15 years, uh, that's estimated to be around 5.7 million. Obviously, the, the reason that this is different, <clears throat> not only is the uh, deletion of the market rate units and the cost burden that comes with them, but 
by having a larger office building, uh, we're able to further shift the, uh, the, the cost allocations that go with some of the parking assumptions as well as providing a, a larger uh, contribution from that office and retail due to additional income being produced by it. So understandably, that's uh, quite a lot of information to digest, but I'd like to you know, make myself available or anybody else on the team available to go through any questions. Well, let, let me sort of lead it off. Um, I, I think we are in a much better position today with these proposals than what we started with. And I appreciate the council and administration and you guys uh, being supportive of taking a second look at it because I, I think we have much, much better options. Uh, when I came into this, uh, I probably was one of the strongest advocates for mixed income and uh, I still am. But I'm also a realist also in terms of what's, what's doable and where the funding comes from. And I guess what has persuaded me in terms of looking at, well, let me tell you why. I'm, I'm talking about the, I guess it's a B2, 80 low income house credits, no, 80 low income house tax credits, plus the retail, plus the office. That's, that's, that's the piece that I'm speaking to. Um, in, in terms of not being able to have market rate units in this development, uh, it's apparent that the cost is extremely high in terms of the benefits that we get out of it. Uh, the other piece that I guess I'm looking at is when I look at how we define um, affordable units in terms of income, 60%, 30%, et cetera, uh, it appears to me that if we're talking about 6% units, you're up at the family income of 30, 40 plus thousand dollars, depending on what, what size your family, which to me could appeal to some of the office workers, teachers, and et cetera, uh, and in our workforce, they would have an opportunity. Uh, when I look at 80 units, you're talking about 20 of those units, 25% of those units at 30% or whatever, and the rest are up at the higher, higher, higher income, which to me approaches the, the market rate piece. Uh, additionally, I think for me, we've always got to build for the future. And I, I, I've always felt that we ought to try to get the most out of that property that we can in terms of not only the opportunity for affordable housing, but what else can come along with it. And by bringing in, you had retail initially, but by bringing in office units, I think, I think we get that. And I, I, I would say that for persons who are talking about not investing in downtown anymore. This is an investment in downtown. It's a different type of investment, but it's an investment in downtown, which I, I, I continue to support. So uh, I end up with the scenario which gives us the 80 low-income housing tax credits, the retail space, and the maximum office space. And the gap, obviously, is the lowest gap that we've got in terms of the scenarios you've got and how we get that, fill that gap. That's up to the council administration to, to figure out, but uh, that's, that's where I'm on the side. Let me recognize Councilman Reese and <coughs> Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciated your words for the staff and our um, nonprofit developer partners for bringing these scenarios forward. I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that uh, I don't think they would have come forward with these scenarios without your leadership uh, and putting that on the table as something that you wanted to see. And um, I think the result of that has been we've got a scenario in concept B2 that I think um, really does tend to maximize the what all the different things we can do with this oddly shaped piece of property um, in a way that I think will really benefit the city. And I think um, I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, I had a question about parking. Um, and you might, might not be the right person to talk about parking. So let me ask you my other question first, and that is this. Um, during the meeting uh, just now, um, we got a, I got a, a message from someone who is uh, watching this particular meeting. 
Um, and I'm not clear if they're in the room or online, but what does it matter? Uh, and the, the question had to do with uncertainty. And uh, you've talked compellingly about the uncertainty of renting the market rate apartment units, the stronger certainty about the affordable units, um, especially those with vouchers associated with them. Um, but you've talked a little bit less <laughs> about uncertainty around the retail and the office space. Can you talk a little bit about um, kind of your perspective on that and whether, how it affects the various scenarios we're facing here? Yeah, I might let uh, Tucker Bartlett from Self Help field those questions. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Tucker Bartlett with Self Help. Uh, yeah, that's, it's, it's a great question, uh, Councilman Reese. Uh, we, uh, if, when we make it, if we make it through tonight and we have a direction that the Council gives us, one of the first things we start doing and working on is trying to locate office retail tenants. So we have not started that process yet until we knew if we were doing an office component or not to it. And the, and the key really would be, uh, so uh, Michael went through the process before, and really it's, it's the May deadline, the full application where you have to have your financing packages together. So the key for us will be identifying, you know, a, a, an, a you know, you, usually when you go to financing, they want to see a certain amount of pre-leasing depending on market strength. So the, uh, the, the banks will be looking at it saying, okay, downtown Durham, what's going on with the office market? How much of it would, would we like to see pre-leased? So we'll have to determine in conjunction with our financing sources, debt, equity, what amount of pre-leasing we'll need, but we will need some pre-leasing. So that is a question going forward and one, you know, a thing we'll be working on diligently starting tomorrow. And this is obviously something that you guys have some experience working on. Correct. Getting tenants and properties. Yeah, uh, self-help as a, de as a developer, I think uh, many of you are familiar with our office buildings downtown, but we have uh, about 25 properties across the state, about 1.3 million square feet, and that is primarily office space in retail on ground floor is sort of the typical thing that we do. So we do have a lot of experience in working these types of projects. Thanks, Tucker. I appreciate you addressing that concern. Yeah. Um, who's the best person to talk to me about parking? It might be me. What's the question? Awesome. Let's do it. Um, I noticed that in, uh, by the way, that person is uh, in the back row here. You want to raise your hand? Thank you for that question. Appreciate it. Um, uh, I noticed that in concept B1 and in B2, those were the only renderings that specifically identified um, well, no, they're not the only ones. In, in A1 and A2, at least one-to-one -one parking spaces were identified as needed for the project. So I'm guessing in A1, that was 101, and in A2, that's 80 or thereabouts. Am I right so far? Yes, on okay. the residential side. Awesome. Because yeah. in A1 and A2, that's, that's all there is. residential, right. Awesome. I'm glad I, when I figure stuff out. Um, B1 and B2, I noticed, didn't have a difference. They both, they were both pegged at 260 parking spaces. Right. Wow. Um, and is that because in the concept B1, the office space is smaller, but there are more residential units? And in B2, there are fewer residential units, but the office space is slightly larger? Right. Am I on the right yeah. track there? Yeah, in both of the B scenarios, you basically have a two-story, we have a two-story parking deck, and there's a certain number of spaces in there estimated to be 260. So if the residential is fixed at one per one, you basically have whatever is left over to do office. So the, the, the reason That lets more, you build the office bigger. It lets you build the office That's what, bigger. So the, off, the size of the office is dictated by the number of parking spaces. Oh, you guys are smart, man. Um, can you, <laughs> eventually, I will get there. So what is the what is the calculation on office square? Is there a, a, a mathematical formula, square foot to spaces? Yeah, there there is. So you, you'll hear different office users require different amounts of parking. And as you know, we're in the CBD, so there's no government-required amount of parking that we're, we're providing. This is really all market-driven. And there's not, you know, I mean, public decks around, so we're trying to provide parking at an adequate rate. And so... You know, you'll hear numbers thrown around about how many parking spaces per thousand square feet of office. And what we're assuming for this one is approximately three per thousand, which is honestly pretty light for office. You'll hear people talk often about four per thousand, but leases being signed downtown by some of the major downtown office users these days are around three per thousand. 
with the understanding at a, a site like this, that's right next to the transit center, some people will take alternative forms of transportation or, or they'll lease spaces in other public decks and walk and walk there. So yeah, so there'll be a combination of, there'll be probably be some workers coming to this site that will not drive a car and park it at this deck. Believe that's it. what the market is requiring these days is three per thousand downtown. Believe it or not, my last question was why the office building was bigger in B2, so now I'm, <clears throat> I'm set, thanks. Okay. Recognize Councilman, did you finish? Yes, I'm Well, let me go, recognize the Mayor Pro Tem, and then Councilman Shule, and then Councilman Moffitt. You. Tucker, <coughs> I have um, <coughs> a question about the, um, I certainly uh, am supportive of the affordable housing space, but I'm also concerned that we need to have affordable retail space. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, there has been an exodus of black-owned businesses from the downtown area. Right. And what do we need to do to increase the likelihood of black businesses coming back and being a part of this space? Yes, I think that is a, a, a great question and an important issue to highlight and one that self-help is looking at across its portfolio of buildings of trying to convert some of you know, more retail space uh, and try to get it as affordable as possible for locally owned businesses to be able to locate there. Uh, so the reality of, 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 of new construction is new construction costs more than converting some of our older spaces downtown to retail. So the, the assumptions that we used in this model um, for the numbers that you're seeing today assume $20 per square foot for retail space. I would call that more affordable than some of the other new construction that's happening, but maybe slightly less affordable than being able to convert an existing retail space downtown and just bringing a new tenant in. So if we just, you know, if the council decided that another one of the public policy benefits it wanted was lower retail rent, that could be something we could, we could talk about. It would just increase the gap. And we're mm -hmm. happy to run sensitivity scenarios about different office. So I'd say where we are now is below market. If you, if you consider the market, you know, some of the new construction around downtown and what they're leasing retail space for, we're, we're, we're below that. But we're above, I'd say, what self-help could lease space. If you think of some of our retail tenants uh, on, you know, on the plaza, uh, we're able to do less than that in, in our existing buildings. So it depends on what where we were trying to get. I agree that's an important issue. Well, perhaps council will be open to providing some sort of incentive uh, to businesses. Mm -hmm. to yeah, you could do it space. that way too. Yeah. <coughs> Recognize Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just, uh, uh, first of all, want to second what Charlie mentioned earlier about the, your role in this, Mr. Mayor, and, and I had uh, at least referred to it a little bit in the work session, which I think that we are on a much better path than we were, uh, thanks to your intervention and getting people back together and suggesting that we take a broader look at this. So thank you for that. I think that really is really, really helped us. Uh, I also uh, want to uh, endorse uh, concept B2 uh, for all the reasons that the mayor uh, said. I think that um, the, the um, we don't want to concentrate poverty, but I don't think that's what we're doing here. Uh, with the, the the memo, I think, did a good job of laying out what the uh, Durham Housing Authority um, average income was, I believe, less than $13,000 per household. And we're certainly not talking about that in this situation. We're talking about a, a much wider mix of incomes. and um, And so I think that I think this will work. Uh, and I think that having the office building is just a tremendous addition. Uh, this, is, this is a really good proposal. And I want to thank the staff, Reginald and company, for working to get, this, get these scenarios together and uh, this helping to forward this much more kind of flexible way of looking at it. And uh, all of you all who've worked on it, I think it's a great proposal. I'm looking forward to it. And, we can figure out the QAP, maybe we can get the tax credits. <laughs> so thank you. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I, am, I missed something, so I want to be sure. 
you're favoring B2? Yes. Mr. Mayor, okay, thank you. Um, so then I'll just, I have two questions then, because I want everything to be on the table. What's the appraised value of the land? Two point eight, and what's the value that's included in the project cost <coughs> for the land? Yes, zero. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Are there other recognized Councilman Johnson? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to reiterate the thanks that my colleagues have already expressed for our, our mayor, our staff, and our um, consultants on this project, and. Um, I think I'm. I think that we would not be doing this without the foresight and leadership of all of the people who have come together um, to make this to make this project happen. I'm really excited about us making this significant invest, investment in affordable housing, especially in downtown, um, where we have seen you know the market has not been able to create affordable housing. The only way that it's going to happen is if is if we step in. Um, I also want to thank the um, community. Um, advocates and residents who have been advocating for affordable housing um, in our community for a number of years and really pushing us on council to be accountable to the community and to um, and to put projects on the ground to put our money where our mouths are and actually produce the produce the the things that our community needs and right now we know that what our community needs um, is is affordable places to live. Um, and I also wanted to say that this um, development is um, really close to my house. It's in my neighborhood, also Tiger's neighborhood. Um, and I think that it's really going to, um, it's really going to improve the circumstances for folks who live where we live. Um, we regularly see emails going across our neighborhood listers of folks looking for housing um, that really want, you know, to live near downtown and can't afford it. And so I'm really excited that um, that we're going to be putting this on the ground and, and that I'll have some some new neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Recognize Councilman North. I'm sorry. I, I do want to make a couple other comments. I do try to oftentimes hold my comments, but I do, on this case, I do want to say that um, it was, I, I, when we heard this is the work session, I favored B2, but I didn't want to take a public stand at that time because I wanted to hear the comments of the rest of my colleagues, um, particularly you, Mr. Mayor. So I'm delighted that we're all on the same page because it looks like we are. I want to thank Self Help and, and all the partners that are involved in this because I think the, the creative um, approach to this with the retail, not just the creative combination of retail office, and I mean, some of that is part of the RFP and some of it is dictated by the UDO, but the way that it's all put together and the way that it all knits together as a, as, a, as a complete whole is really great. And finally, I also want to thank Durham Can. I think um, that Can deserves a lot of credit because they really pushed um, for this project. Uh, and um, so I, and I, I don't want it to go unsaid that um, community advocates, specific community advocates like Durham Can have stood up and made a difference here. So thank you. Well, I, I appreciate that, Don. And, uh, Members of CAN were part of this new focus. So as you know, although I approached the idea, I did spend time with them trying to explain what, what we're trying to do. And some of their leadership was supportive of it. But ha having said that, are there <coughs> any more comments on this item? I think the staff is looking for some direction. Uh, it, I'll make a motion. Yes. <coughs> I offer uh, that we uh, move forward with concept B two as the preferred design. As the preferred design. I'll second that. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Yeah, Thank Tablet back up again. What, what's the next item? 28 consolidated item for REA commercial. Right. Item 28. 
26. 26. 26 should be. <coughs> Jacob. Good evening. I'm Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Um, requests for a future land use map amendment and zoning map change have been received for a 27 acre parcel located at 4343 Garrett Road. Um, the subject site is currently designated as medium density residential on the future land use map and as residential rural on the zoning atlas. Um, the applicant is requesting to change these designations to commercial on the future land use map and to commercial general for the development plan on the zoning map. Um, the associated development plan with this request commits to a maximum of 200,000 square feet of floor space um, for self storage. Um, some key commitments shown on the associated development plan include um, points of access to the site. Which um, number are we on? Uh, 26. Jacob. 26. Well, my apologies. It's both the oh, I'm sorry. Oh. That helps so we had two. <laughs> like, what? So I thought you were trying to trick us there, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> Did I read that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me try that again. Thank you. Draw that map, Tom. <laughs> um, Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. So this <laughs> is a future land use map and and zoning map change request um, uh, for a property located at 7130 North Carolina Highway 751. Um, and I would also like to state for the record that this item, as well as the other two planning items this evening, have been noticed in accordance with state law and applicable ordinances. Um, for this particular request, um, the site is currently designated as office on the future land use map and is zoned um, office and institutional with a development plan and residential suburban 20. The applicant is requesting to change these designations to commercial on the future land use map and commercial general with a development plan on the zoning atlas. Um, the applicant is committing to a maximum of 30,000 square feet of floor area for commercial uses. Um, the associated development plan includes commitments such as the building and parking envelope, project boundary buffers, and right-of-way dedication along NC-751. Um, on July 11th, the Planning Commission heard both of these requests and recommended approval unanimously by vote of 12 to 0. There will be two votes to approve this item. The first is a motion to adopt a resolution regarding the comprehensive plan amendment and also to adopt a consistency statement. The second motion is to adopt a zoning ordinance. Um, staff finds that these two items are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances, and I'm happy to answer any questions that the council may have. Uh, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. I would ask other questions first by members of the council. <coughs> I recognize Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Jacob, there were recommendations of, uh, by the, in the uh, TIA. Are they committed to in this rezoning request? There are TIA commitments on the development plan for this. Were there, were there, were there commitments? Did they, were there ones that, did they cover all of the TIA recommendations in this study? Sure. Yes, uh, Bill Judge, Transportation, the applicant is proffering all of the roadway, recommended roadway improvements from the TIA. Okay, thank you very much. Other questions, yes. Council? Uh, we have um, one person who signed up to speak for this item, Tim Sivers. Sivers? Sivers, I guess. <laughs> Is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item who has a sign up? If not, you have three minutes. Thank you, sir. Uh, Tim Sivers. Uh, yes, it is Sivers. I appreciate that. Horvath Associates, uh, 16 Consultant Place, Durham, North Carolina. Uh, thank you, Jacob, for the, uh, for the report. Um, I'll just briefly go over a few items tonight. Uh, we did hold a neighborhood meeting for this project. Um, unfortunately, only the, uh, the property owners came out to the site. There were no neighbors that reached out to me. Um, no neighbors attended the meeting as well. Uh, I did check with uh, staff today, and as of this morning, there were no, uh, no negative <laughs> feedback from any of the adjacent property owners. The parcel is a total of three parcels, totaling 2.7 acres. The site's comprised of one vacant commercial parcel and two single-family residential parcels. 
The vacant, uh, the vacant commercial parcel was rezoned in 2003, and a site plan was approved in 2009 for a 10,000 square foot office space. But that was never constructed due to the economy at that time. The request in front of you tonight is to change commercial, to change office to commercial land use and rezone the parcel to general commercial. The, uh, the pro proposed commercial land use is consistent with adjacent land use patterns in the area. It's consistent with policy 2.2.2, 2.31A, 231E, by extending the existing commercial node, promotes orderly develop, development, and provides vehicular and pedestrian connections to the existing commercial center. Policy 231D does state the office can be used as a transition, but this parcel is better served as a commercial site for the reasons I've mentioned, and in addition, standalone office is currently minimal demand for a parcel of this size. As stated in the staff report, this proposal is not out of character for the area. The proposal also includes to rezone the parcel from OID and RS20 to CG, committing to right-of-way dedication, road improvements, 30,000 square foot maximum building area, 70% maximum impervious area, as well as an interconnection to the ex existing shopping center and building design commitments. I'm available if you have any questions. Thank you. The, the plan is to construct storage space on this property. <coughs> I'm sorry, sorry, can you repeat that? Is, is the, I'm sorry, I should have asked you. Is the plan to construct storage space on this, on this property? No, that is not the current plan, sir. 30,000 square feet. Uh, there's been a lot of self-storage brought in front of this uh, board in the past. Majority of those are in the 100,000 square feet and above. 30,000 square feet is, is very small for self-storage. And if, if necessary to, to prove that, sir, I'm willing to commit that we will not permit self-storage on this, on this site. I have no problem proffering that if that is the house. I, I'd like to see that. Are you willing to proffer that? Consider it done, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor, I'll just, Mr. Mayor, I'll just point out that directly adjacent to these properties to the whatever direction that is north, that's not north, that's east, um, is a large self-storage space that's currently under construction. Yeah. Uh, so I'd, but yeah, thank you for asking that question. Thank you. Uh, are there other questions or comments on this item? <coughs> just briefly, Mr. Mayor. Broken House Councilman Reese. Uh, these are, I haven't closed the public hearing, so we're still on. Awesome. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to briefly mention that um, I drive past this location most days, very close to my home, and um, the persistence of these uh, small residential properties has always been a little odd to me. Um, it seems very out of keeping with the way that the particular area has developed over time. Um, I know there are apartments to the south on both sides of 751 apartment uh, apartments. But um, I think that given the how successful this particular commercial area uh, has been, uh, that's just to the north and east of this proposed rezoning, I think the the proposed uh, zoning uh, <coughs> is appropriate, and I intend to vote for the matter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any other comments before I close the public hearing? Uh, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item that has not had an opportunity to speak, either for or against? If not, let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak. I would require the public can be closed. As a matter of fact, for the council. Mr. Mayor. So are we voting here? Uh, who did? Who made the motion? Hmm? Who made the motion? I don't know. I make. I move the. Who was there second? Okay. I recognize Councilman Moffitt for comments. I have just some concern about um, commercial node creep. But given the apartment complex to the south in this particular case, I think that that's probably limited, so I'll support the motion. But I just think that's a concern that council needs to keep in mind. All right. Uh, if there are no further questions, call the question. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Move the consistency statement. Second. Been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Next item is item 27, consolidated item for ample storage, Sandy Creek, A16000014. 
C-16-00030. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins, <coughs> the Planning Department. Um, so this case is for a 27-acre parcel located at 4343 Garrett Road. Um, this site is currently designated as medium density residential on the future land use map and as residential rural on the zoning atlas. The applicant for this property is requesting to change these designations to commercial and commercial general with a development plan respectively. Um, the development plan commits to a maximum of 200,000 square feet of floor area for self storage purposes. Um, some other key commitments noted on the associated development plan include the site access points, the building and parking envelope, um, right of way dedication, as well as preservation of environmental features. Um, the Planning Commission heard this item at their August um, 8th hearing and recommended approval by a vote of 11 to 0. Um, there would be two motions required for this item. The first regarding the resolution for the comprehensive plan amendment, as well as a consistency statement. The second motion is to adopt a zoning ordinance. Um, and staff finds that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan, and I'm happy to answer any questions that the council may have. Thank you. This is the public hearing. The public hearing is open. You heard staff report. I would ask the questions first by members of the council. <coughs> uh, hearing none, recognize Patrick Biker as one who signed up as a proponent. Before you speak, Patrick, is anyone else who wants to speak on this item? Uh, if not, uh, you have three minutes. Yes, sir. <coughs> Good evening, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem, Cole McFadden, members of the City Council. My name is Patrick Biker. I'm with Morningstar Law Group. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. Along with Mr. Terry Wethington of Ample Storage, we represent the applicant for this project, and we very much appreciate the staff's presentation and recommendation. By way of introduction, Ample Storage has been offering quality storage solutions in Durham and across the Triangle for many years. I would be remiss if I did not brag on Ample Storage a little bit since their current facility on Garrett Road has been there for almost 20 years, and it is in pristine, practically brand new condition today, which is a testament to how well Ample operates their facilities. This project before you tonight essentially will be an extension of Ample's existing facility on Garrett Road. With the growth our city is experiencing, there has been a steady increase in the demand for self-storage. Ample's existing facility is consistently rented out at more than 90% of its capacity, similar to Ample's other locations in Durham. There are plenty of existing neighborhoods near this location with families that will continue to have increasing storage needs. There are many benefits to Ample's development plan that is before you tonight. Self-storage is one of the least traffic producing uses there is. You're probably familiar with the traffic conditions in this area. Daily traffic volumes on Garrett Road are around 12,000, and the capacity of this three-lane section on Garrett is 16,000 cars per day. Accordingly, this proposal preserves that traffic capacity for future development or redevelopment along Garrett Road, since this project will not result in any appreciable increase in traffic. You also probably noticed that approximately half of the site acreage on this development plan is preserved. Generally speaking, the areas closest to the stream, which runs through the property, will be left undisturbed. This feature of the development plan further demonstrates why self-storage makes sense at this location. It is doubtful there are many uses that could be established here with this level of preservation, and that will benefit in preserving the natural features that exist on this parcel. Finally, I want to touch on the text commitments that relate to transit. You will notice that text commitment number two is a proffer to dedicate right-of-way for the future light rail. As you know, these plans are not set in concrete, which made proffering this commitment very difficult. Also, if it is determined by Go Durham and Go Triangle that additional bus stop is needed along this corridor, Ample has offered to provide that on its property. Not even 1,000 feet north of this site, on the same side of Garrett Road, lies stop 5570, known as Garrett Road at Ample Storage Stop. Nothing in the UDO nor the comprehensive plan would require Ample to, de to dedicate yet another bus stop in such close proximity, but Ample is willing to work with the city to improve our transit options. Based on all these advantages, the Planning Commission recommended approval unanimously. For all these reasons, we respectfully ask for your approval, and we'll be happy to try and answer any, answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, other <coughs> Pardon me, are there questions of the developer on this item? I 
let, let me uh, make some comments. Uh, and the comments are relative to the amount of uh, storage that we build in this, in this community and where it's been concentrated. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of torn on this because I, I do know the reputation that Ample has. I, I know the facility that uh, they've constructed on Garrett Road, which if you didn't know any better, you might not know it was a storage facility. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't have any question in terms of what they're capable. And I, I should also say, I know what they built in the industrial park, UDI has. Right. And they didn't do as good a job on UDI as they did on Garrett Road, but uh, <laughs> that's another point. But ha having said that, I, I wonder if has any thought been given by the planning staff in terms of where we are in building storage units, allowing storage units to be built in, in the community and in the particular areas? Mr. Mayor, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Um, <clears throat> a number of communities have begun to look at this issue in detail um, with particular concern about the fact that relative to other commercial or light industrial uses, this type of use does not have a uh, high amount of permanent employment associated with it and is relatively low on tax value relative to other commercial and light industrial uses. So what a lot, some of our peer communities have done is uh, put in separation requirements, similar to what we have for group homes, they've required uh, that fir the first floor uses be uh, some other non-residential use to help activate the street and to reduce the uh, impacts on character of the neighborhood. So that's a long-winded say a way of saying we are looking and evaluating at potential options uh, to, um, to bring to you all, first we'll go to the Joint City County Planning Committee uh, in December uh, with kind of a white paper that looks at what some of our peer cities have done uh, and uh, allow you all to consider that further, but we certainly are gonna look at it and bring you all some options. At this time, however, there is not anything that speaks directly to this in the comprehensive plan. Well, can I ask the, the developer some questions? Are uh, you? Sorry, right, well, yeah, sure. Well, just give, give me a sense as to what type of proposal are you it would be very similar to what's on Garrett Road right now. That that level of building height, it, it would be, in my comments, I said it's an extension of the existing facility on Garrett Road. That's exactly what it is, Mayor Bell. Same building heights, same appearance, same everything really is what's already there. So relatively low buildings. Uh, and again, uh, you all know Garrett Road well. It's, it's important, I think, to put this... Um, this type of use at this location because it's a very low traffic generator relative to other uses there in Garrett Road. So it's really an extension of what's been there for almost 20 years uh, in terms of, uh, it won't be one of the higher, higher multi-story, multi-story. Uh, multi is, 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 is that somehow built, that is that built into any of these comments that you have here in terms of, where's the section on? When you speak about the, the type of material and mm -hmm. the height and all that stuff, right. is that in here? Which, 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 which? <coughs> Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Um, attachment 7, we'll talk about the um, a summary of the commitments. Um, the plans do not currently have a commitment for maximum height. Uh, can, can you all speak to that? The yeah. yeah, except for the architectural feature at the entryway, that'd be about 22 feet. Everything would be below that, Mayor. So really, you're looking at structures that'd be only about 20 feet in height. Is, is there any way you can reference not to exceed what you have already existing? Um, not to exceed what's already there? Can, can you speak we, to the planning? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, we can wordsmith with the planning department tomorrow morning that we won't have any buildings that exist the, that exceed the existing building heights on Garrett Road. For and, and what about, uh, I think what's attractive about what you have is <coughs> the landscaping along along Garrett Road. Mm -hmm. Do you speak to any of that in, in here? 
No, we can accept that proffer. Um, I'm sorry, was there? Yeah, uh, that's what I'm trying to get to. Uh, yeah, we, we can accept that proffer. What proffer? That that there would uh, the building height would not exceed any of the existing buildings at the adjacent site. I'm sorry, landscape. What about the landscape? <coughs> oh. I mean, I, I think you've got a pretty good idea of what you're going to build. I'm trying. Yeah, to, trying very to, similar. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, that would be very similar to the ordinance requirements that are in place uh, currently at that location. Just want to make sure that when I'm working with Director Young in the morning, that we don't ex we're just making sure that we don't exceed anything that's already there on Garrett Road. Right. Got it. We're on what the about the page. landscaping? Um, we could figure that out. I mean, obviously, we'd meet the UDO requirements. I, I'm not sure that what's already there goes above and beyond that. But in mm -hmm. regards to street trees and uh, landscaping, that that's already a pretty strong uh, requirement in the UDO, given that it's a CG zone. What are you saying? Yeah, I, 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 not directly familiar with what's out there. It's been, as the applicant indicated, it's been out there for quite a while. So a lot of that vegetation is mature. It, I think it would be unlikely to be planted at that level of the size. But, but in terms of the design, uh, um, we could work with the applicant to identify you know, equivalent landscaping to the adjacent site. But I, I do believe that's very similar to what the current minimum ordinance standards are. And I guess another right. feature that I think is attractive and not landscaping and the frequency is the parking, existing parking mm -hmm. is up front towards mm -hmm. the road on that. Is there any difference? Okay, so our parking being in the back, right? Uh, the parking on the, on the, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, you, sorry. And could you introduce yourself, please? Terry Weathington. I work for Ample Storage. Right. <laughs> the difference in this site and the existing Garrett Road site the park, the existing parking that's on this site is up closer to the road. Mm -hmm. So we would not be able to maintain the same type of landscaping that we have at the existing Garrett Road. We will put nice landscaping across the front, but the difference parking lot is up at the front of the road. So it's already there. It's an existing parking facility, so we can't landscape you, you, have, you, you have a lot of brick on your existing facility. Do you plan to continue that? The, the brick is all the way across the front. And Everything you, will be brick across so you, you, the front. you plan to continue that then? I yes, sir. Sorry, I, didn't, I don't hear well. Yeah, yes, sir. All right. Is, is this planning staff picking this up? I'm not trying to design it, but I, I know what's there. Mm -hmm. and yeah, just brick facade along. It's a, it's a brick facade across the front, yes. Yeah, we can work with the planning staff to make sure it's it's essentially a brick facade across the uh, street frontage, similar to what's there now. So, so, Mr. Mayor, another feature of the adjacent site, that the current ample storage site, which is not required by the ordinance, is that there's a wrought iron fence with brick columns, and that, that's not an ordinance requirement. So I'm just, that's a, just a point of information. But if they want to put that in, commit to that, they could do that, right? They, they could. I, just, I haven't heard that. And it would be impossible to do the brick fencing like you cannot at the existing right. facility because the parking's the, all the way to the parking the road. Line. Right. You can't put that fencing across that existing parking lot. You can do it on both sides of it, but you can't do it across that parking lot on what was the uh, golf driving range office. Right. Yeah, if you remember that. Okay. Um, well, again, the positive is I know what you can do and what you have done mm. in those type of facilities, and I would not want you to do anything any less than you already have existing, uh, if in fact it's going to be built. And I, I just like some kind of assurances that that's, that will happen. And Patrick, you, because you won't be coming before me too much longer, but uh, <laughs> uh, if, if you are committed to it, I think that's important for this council and one of the future councils now. Sure. Recognize Councilman Shule. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so this is, Patrick, uh, now going to be a kind of row of self-storage out here. Um, and, it, you know, the, the planning staff has spoken to the fact that this will not be, mm -hmm. I guess the current parlance is activating the, the uh, street, uh, street front. Um, 
And I just want to say that this concerns me a lot. I'm glad to hear, uh, Patrick, that you all are looking at, at this. W when would we hear from you all in terms of, you said a, a white paper will be coming to, I guess, JCCPC in December. In December, so it would be January, February. It would be, say again. If we get direct, adequate direction from Joint City County Planning Committee, it would be early next year. That you could bring to us? Yes. Okay. Um, so I, I'm interested in, in hearing from the developer, Patrick, either you or mm -hmm. uh, the representative here. Um, is ample building storage facilities that have, you know, in, in other places that have you know, retail involved or, uh, you know, other kind of, <laughs> other kinds of uh, facilities such as Patrick described? Not to my knowledge, sir. Well, wait a minute. Let's, you have a certain level of retail in, <coughs> you have a certain level of retail out in the UDI park. Oh, sure, but that's asso Office associated with the storage. It wouldn't be independent of that. Right. Well, I meant, that's what I meant. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant associated with the storage. Right, right. You do. You do that. I think. My question is, do you have retail associated with storage, you know, say on the first floor of your storage or on the frontage of your storage in other places? That's my question. So for sign boxes and things we like that? We do have some, some, are you talking about ancillary uses at storage business like selling boxes or separate no. commercial entities? Separate commercial entities. There will not be at this no. facility. Do you do it anywhere? We do have them at some facilities, but they were designed for that industry. I understand. In the so that's something, do you do that currently? I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, you know, what is the future here of, of you know, so, you know, mm -hmm. Patrick, you're hearing what Pat Young right. is saying. It depends sure. on the location that you go in. Some facilities do warrant some, and I wouldn't call it so much retail as I would I guess it could, it could be retail. You could consider it retail. It's other business type. Normally it's service businesses. Mm -hmm. For example, in, in UDI's park, they have some office space. They have an insurance agent there. They might have a, uh, I don't know if you've got an Uber service there. I see a lot of limousines out there. They have, they are, they're on the same property. They aren't attached to the storage facility, but they're sort of set off. They've done good taste. I'm not knocking it, but that's, they do have that. So would that work here? Well, that's an interesting question because when you're looking at Garrett Road, as I referenced in my comments, you've got a road that's at 12,000 cars per day with a capacity of, six, of 16,000 cars per day. And there's certainly other opportunities for redevelopment along the Garrett Road corridor. So it would, to a certain extent, be robbing Peter to pay Paul if we use that type, if we incorporated those types of services, it would by, by necessity uh, increase the traffic numbers that are reflected in your staff report. But there again, that would diminish capacity for existing redevelopment, existing redevelopment opportunities on Garrett Road that I think are going to be looked at in the, I would assume be looked at in the months and years ahead. We, we do already operate the, what you would call retail facilities at the Gold Center, which is just on the other side of the course. There is a strip center there in front of that that we operate. So the, um, okay, well, in, in, are, are, do, do you all have any other storage facilities planned to bring to Durham in the near future? Oh, yes. Storage facilities in Durham? Yeah, besides 55 or existing storage. That you're planning? No, uh, no, 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 we don't. We have the, the one on 55 that the council approved unanimously is underway, is going mm -hmm. forward. There's but other than this one, no, we have nothing else in the pipeline, but we want to be clear that we are also building one on Highway 55 that the council approved six months ago, maybe. Yep. Okay. Well, so, you know, I'm reluctant, especially given the fact that we have this new, <coughs> you know, potential policy coming to us, which I think could, could really improve what we're getting with these facilities. Um, uh, and especially in a location like this, Garrett Road, which as you said, Patrick, is, you know, really ripe for development and we want it to be a street where 
they're you know an attractive, uh, you know, activated street, and uh, so I have, I have I have concerns about it. Uh, I do want do want to reiterate for the council that I, my understanding is city um, NCDOT is moving forward with great separation of Garrett Road and 15501. So just keep in mind there is certainly going to be a large uh, traffic improvement happening there. At least that's my understanding from uh, the folks at DOT. Yeah. So this is not going to be a what you might call a pedestrian oriented area. Thank you. Uh, are the staff has some comments? Mr. Mayor, if I might, yeah, I, I would ask um, the applicant to repeat the additional commitments and, and as a point of information before you, you all do that, um, <coughs> the existing site that you refer to on Garrett Road, the ample storage site, has got a, a quantity of shrubs and hedges that exceed the ordinance minimums and it also has a wrought iron fence with, with brick columns. None, none of that is required by ordinance standards. The applicant referred to the fact that the subject site in front of you is a former uh, drive, golf driving range. There is a parking lot there, but it, it's my professional opinion that if there's not additional right-of-way dedicated at that location, that could be, that sh appears that it could be fit, the, the, shrub, the shrubs and hedges and fence could be fit in between the parking lot and the right-of-way. I can't say that for sure without a survey or some other assessment of site conditions. That's just information, and then I would need to get a clarification on a commitment from you. Uh, please. Certainly. <coughs> well, is there any other questions from the council? No, I'd like you to respond to that. Yes, thank you. Uh, certainly, as additional commitments, we will not exceed, the, the proposal before the council tonight will not exceed the building heights existing uh, in the adjacent ample storage facility uh, located to the north. Um, obviously, with the uh, we have to make sure that the entry feature that I referred to fits with that, but I believe it does. Uh, secondly, uh, the landscaping that Mr. Young uh, referred to, we will match the uh, existing landscaping that's to the facility, uh, that's existing on the facility to the north. And the last commitment that I understood that was desired by <coughs> uh, Mayor Bell is um, a brick facade along Garrett Road for the. Uh, it does have brick. Yeah, we brick facade along Garrett Road. Right. Well, I, I, I'm comfortable with that. I, and again, primarily because I, I know what the developer is capable of doing, what they have done in this community. Yes, sir. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that I still have some issues with so many storage facilities. Recognize Councilman Mark. Yeah, um, one of the things that. Mr. Young mentioned that you did not was fencing. Um, is there any intention to fence this facility? Behind the parking lot. It's, it's built in what we refer to as a fortress style. The buildings on the interior are built around the outside. There will be fencing between those buildings. And, and what kind of fencing do you anticipate having between those buildings? We'll have areas like around the detention pond in the back of the facility that aren't visible from the street. They would be with some sort of hurricane fencing. When I, I assume that if I rent a unit here, I'm going to access that unit off of Garrett Road. Correct. Correct. And then when I drive onto the property in order to secure it, I'm going to have to drive through a gate. Correct. That will be visible from Garrett Road. And what do you anticipate that fencing to be? So the gate itself is a decorative, it's made of aluminum, but it's a one inch square tubing, uh, black rail, top rail, bottom rail, and it has an ornamental fitting at the top of each of the, the tickets. So all of the fencing between the buildings and gate visible from Garrett Road, that, or, or on closest to Garrett Road, will be this one inch tubing? It would be the gate only. The rest of it would be brick. Brick? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. All right. The gate is the only the only barrier that, could, that would right. be visible through, and it's very obscure. Right. So, um, the, uh, so I, have a con I have a concern that's been raised, raised first by the mayor and then also brought up by uh, Council Member Shule, which is that um, the flip side to the not using any of the capacity of the road is it's not adding anything to the to the um, to activating the road to bringing uh, bringing life to it to bringing activity to the road 
and um, no, very few jobs, and uh, you know, actually very few, very, it's, so it's hard for me to really picture in my mind what's, how this makes the rest of that area more appealing for commercial development. One, one thing that storage business does bring, where it may not bring a retail space, like you mentioned before, there's a tremendous amount of startup business that operates out of a storage unit itself. Uh, landscaping companies, uh, any startup company uh, that can't, maybe can't afford a, a brick and mortar storefront, a lot of them get their start at a high security upscale facility like we provide. Uh, we have special gate hours for commercial tenants, and some of our facilities have as much as 30% commercial tenants. They don't have commerce out the front of their unit. They'll come there and pick up their equipment at the beginning of the day, go out and do their day's work, and come back in that facility and safely store their equipment and or materials. So it's, it does have a certain commercial value to the community. I, thank you. I do think that um, the issues that have been raised are really important. Um, I'm glad to hear that the staff is proceeding with a study on concentration of uh, self-storage units, what might be reasonable. And um, I hope that the new council takes that up. This will be the project that um, inspired um, additional, at least additional look at that. Um, I, truthfully, I, I accept that uh, Ample will do a professional job of designing and building landscaping and fencing, um, but I'm still struggling with the concentration of, of uh, storage in this area. So I'm, I'm, I'm still, at this moment, contemplating how I'm going to vote on this. Thank you. I recognize Councilman Davis. Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm also Williams. towing um, with this. I rode down Garrett Road today, and I also looked at the last attachment here, and it looks like there are plenty of um, storage spaces available. Uh, however, I am moved by the idea that, according to Mr. Young, there will be a study made uh, to see about the uh, proliferation of these types of units along the way. Um, with that said, um, I, I think you've met all of the requests and qualifications along the way, and it looks like the Planning Commission supported it. So um, I'd be supportive of this particular piece, but looking forward to where we will go down the, few, down the road. I'm looking forward to how the council will go down the road. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Welcome. Well, recognize Councilman Reese. I share what appears to be a universal concern about how these uh, storage facilities are, appear to be concentrated in uh, the southwestern part of our city, uh, where I happen to live. Um, <clears throat> I also um, am a little bit disconcerted by the fact that, the, that this would more than double the existing uh, ample storage at that location. Is that right? Phases one, two, and three total somewhere around 150, 160,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. This would be about 200,000 square feet. Uh, so I share all the concerns that my colleagues have raised, and the project does give me pause for that reason. <clears throat> Having said that, um, I did want to bring into the conversation um, some of the comments at the Planning Commission uh, by uh, Commissioner Tom Miller, um, who uh, identified an additional consideration that hasn't been mentioned tonight, and that is that of all the uses that this particular piece of property could be put to, this is likely the least intense from an ecological perspective. There is a waterway that runs near the back of this particular property, um, 200,000 square feet of um, storage space is a pretty thin usage um, for um, the portion of the property that the applicant has committed to building upon, and that still leaves the uh, a significant portion of it um, as um, not impacted directly by the development. Uh, I think, you know, in a perfect world, I think each of us could sit here and try to consider a better use for it, um, but uh, none that has 
this little impact on the on the water course that runs through the property and, and has less of an eco environmental and ecological impact. I'll be honest with you, I find myself in the same situation as my colleague Don Moffat. I, I really don't know which way I'm going to go on this yet, so, um, but I just wanted to put that, bring that into the room as something I thought that our planning commissioner um, uh, adequately described for us as a consideration as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Welcome. Recognize Councilman Johnson. Thank and, you. And the Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanted to ask you all a couple of questions about walkability of the area. My Usually when we're talking about wanting folks to activate a street, it's so that people can walk around. My impression of this area is that it's not particularly walkable, um, but I have just recently learned that there is a sidewalk that runs right in front of your building, but looking at a map, it looks like it doesn't go very far in other direction, in either direction. Do you all have a sense of, um, like, how whether that sidewalk is actually being actively used um, to access the the commercial, like commercial establishments on Garrett Road? To access, do people use the sidewalk? Do people use that sidewalk? Like, is that, is there pedestrian traffic there in some. front of I've, the existing? I've witnessed building? some there. I've, I've made several trips out there working towards this, and there is some pedestrian traffic. I, can I offer a little intelligence? Yeah. And until this fall, um, this was the route that I took our girls to school every morning. So I would often travel. I, I would see lots of folks. I think where you get the most sidewalk traffic is between the apartment complex on the north, near the northwestern corner of Garrett and 15501. Um, and walking from there down south on 751, I'm sorry, on Garrett, excuse me. Uh, toward the bus stop that's very close to there. And you also see some foot traffic over to the, um, to the I forget what store that is. There's a, um, a discount, it's a, like, a, like a Goodwill, but not really Goodwill. I can't remember what that's called. But there is a Goodwill. Is that, it's the Goodwill, okay, Goodwill. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so you do see some foot traffic through there as well. But I've never seen anyone trying to cross the street to get to that little mini uh, commercial area that's right across the street. I think there's it's right in front of the phase one of the self storage, and there's like a uniform store, and uh, I don't even know what else is in there. A couple of stores I've never seen anyone walk over there to get. As far as um, moving south on Garrett from there, there's only like the pet store, the pet shop where they do the pet care and mm -hmm. grooming and whatnot. I've probably talked more than you need. I'm done. Thank you. No, that was, that, yeah, that was super helpful. I mean, I I share what appears to be a universal um, <laughs> un, uncertainty about this project. I feel like there are, um, yeah, I mean, I, I share a concern that we are packing a lot of self-storage into this area. I also think that the ecological concerns are important and that I'm not sure if, if we're going to prioritize activating streets, I'm not sure this is a street that necessarily um, warrants um, more attention given the low amount of pedestrian traffic in the existing land use pattern, which is very, um, which looks to me significantly suburban car oriented development that I don't think is going to shift. Um, but yeah, I feel like a lot of us don't really know where to, where to land on this. So I'm not really sure I'm not sure where to go with that. Maybe maybe someone could offer a suggestion. I'm going to recognize the mayor pro tem since she was um, next now. Will you be offering um, space for small businesses in this location? We, we like I said, we already have them at the existing yeah, I know. facility. Mm -hmm. There's just there's a strip there across the road frontage here. It would just be storage units, but it would it does lend itself to startup business. Okay. There's a tremendous right. amount of small commercial people trying to get trying to get up off the ground. So this is in essence um, more economical for them. That's correct. Than having it there. You well, you have my vote. I kind of call it to borrow a phrase an incubator. <coughs> it's a good place for somebody to get get started. Okay. Yeah, I've noticed in uh, areas throughout the city that uh, businesses are able to um, 
house equipment there that they can't take to right. their neighborhoods. That's and right. so that's a good thing for me. And, it, and, and they know it, it will be safe. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, again, I, I too read the Planning Commission report and uh, Tom wrote a rather extensive justification for why he supported it, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the whole Planning Commission supported it. Uh, my concerns were along the lines that I just talked about, more the aesthetics of the facility that's going to be constructed there. Uh, and I guess I'm driven more by the fact that I, I do know the history of what the developer has done, and I think they've built one of the, if you're going to have a storage unit, I think they've built one of the more quality storage units in, in, our, in our community. And the fact that they're are expanding on an existing facility, uh, still going to try to maintain the attributes of what they have uh, is, is enough for me to, to support the, the unit. But I, if there aren't any further questions, I'm going to recognize Council Margaret. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on intensive use. I'm not sure what Mr. Miller based his opinion on. But um, self-storage units tend to be, when I think about uh, impacts on, on eco ecological impacts, I think about impervious surface. Um, and uh, self-storage units tend to be a lot of impervious surface. Uh, I recognize that the site itself doesn't lend itself to being completely built out, but that would be true of any use. And um, so I'm not saying that self-storage in this case is a more intense use, but I uh, I, I fail to see how it's a less intense use unless we want to say, well, there's fewer cars idling or parking because we don't have the same traffic. So I, I, um, I don't, I don't want to disparage. Mr. Miller's not here to make his case. Um, I'm just not understanding exactly what his case is. Oh. So um, anyways, I, I do also care about the environment. I'm just not clear on how this is less impactful. Oh, Thank you. If I may, Council Member Moffitt, uh, what, what I believe Council uh, Commissioner Miller was, was looking at is, let's say we follow the future land use map and develop this as garden style apartments. The development plan before you, this is about a 28 acre site, 14 acres are left undisturbed, 50% with the plan that's before you tonight. If we were coming, if I were coming before you with a garden style apartments, it'd be way more than 14 acres that we would need to develop in order to make the project work. You would have okay, let me, maybe just a few acres left undisturbed. Only the minimum buffering requirements would be uh, left undisturbed if we were to move uh, in accordance with the future land use map. Okay, that, opinion, that may be true. Let me, let me just check here real quick. Sure. Of the, tw I'm, I heard 28 acres, about half of it being developed. All okay. part, yes, sir. So the question I have is, it's four, are the 14 undisturbed acres developable? Some of it is. Because I saw a lot of steep slopes on the uh, creek and steep slopes. So. Some of that acreage, and I'll get Mr. Wiggins to help break this down for us in more detail, but some of that acreage is um, stream buffer area, some of it is steep slopes, some of it is other areas that would be highly constrained for development, but some of it is being voluntarily set aside above and beyond the ordinance requirements by the applicant. Okay. That, that Good. Can we get an estimate on how much is being set aside? What the reduction in the impact is? You can get really, really, really rough. Um, Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Um, there's an area, I'm going to say approximately about six acres in size that could probably be developed. Okay. It, it might be tricky, but it is feasible, I think. Okay. Thanks. Is that, is that it? Any other questions or comments? Uh, if not, I'm going to close the public hearing and bring the matter back before the council for entertain a motion in one direction or another. Move the resolution. I think is the right. Is that the right move? Amending the comprehensive plan. The resolution to amend the comprehensive plan. Second. As directed in the agenda item. Improper move and second, Madam Clerk. We open the vote and close the vote. It passes six to one with Councilmember Moffitt voting no. I will uh, yeah, what am I supposed to do here? I will uh, move the consistency statement. Second. Improper move, second. 
Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Will you close the vote? It passes six to one with Council Member Moffat voting no. I'm sorry, would you change, that's a consistency statement. Would you change mine to yes, please? It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Point of order, and did you move just the plan amendment or did you move both the plan amendment and the zone case? And then the first motion. The first motion I made was as directed in the agenda. It's, it reads to adopt a resolution amending comprehensive plan to establish commercial as the site's designation of the future land use map. The second item as directed in the agenda was adopt a consistency statement. Um, is there a, do I need to do a third thing? Yes. Uh, um, Jacob Williams of the Planning Department. The first motion has two components, being the future land use map amendment and the consistency statement. The second motion is technically the zoning map change. Thank you. Ordinance. Thank you, Councilmember Moffat. And I'll make that motion as well. Second. And that's to include the zoning. Yeah, that's the actual zoning change. change. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes six to one with Councilmember Moffat voting no. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Mr. Mayor, before you move to the council, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, our staff for providing the hearing and the enhancement uh, uh, for our applicant. Um, it talks about the, shows the technology yeah. that the clerk's office has put forth in terms of our um, devices here. Yeah, in compliance really appreciate with ADA. It. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Recognize the council member. I need to check something out with the staff, um, based on the conversation that just happened, which was not my understanding, is that the first motion on the REA case, the case that we already heard, should have been the plan amendment and the consistency statement. Mm -hmm. But the motion that was made was to move the item, and the second motion was the consistency statement. Therefore, the zoning case in the REA case, I do not believe was approved. And so I would move, if, it's, if we can do so, I will move approval for item 26, 26. Correct. of the zoning part of that case. Uh, Jacob Wiggins, the planning department. Um, Councilman Moffat is correct, and I apologize that Second I misheard um, during that item. But yeah, I'd, uh, just make sure everything is correct with the record. Um, I would recommend that the council vote to approve the zoning ordinance for item number 26. I just seconded it. Uh, Moffitt moved and uh, McFadden seconded it. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Open the vote. Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Moffitt. Mr. Mayor, can I just recognize Councilman Reese? Thank you. Jacob, can you help me understand how this is structured? I, I, we've, we've changed how we've done this at least once while I've been on the council. Mm -hmm. um, I, I thought we changed it such that we were doing the consistency statement first and then the zoning, mm -hmm. but these agenda items have something else first mm -hmm. and specifically list second motion to adopt the consistency statement. I realize now there's an and at the end of that, and so the second motion should be both the consistency statement and adopting the amendment to the UDO. I'm just looking at item 26 now. Um, so, in a perfect world, if we were to do exactly do this exactly the way you think it ought to be done, would it have been on item 26? Um, the first motion would be to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map uh, as as indicated in the agenda, and then that is seconded and then moved. And then the second motion, uh, I move to adopt a consistency statement and an ordinance amending the UDO as directed in the agenda item. Is that the appropriate way to structure it? Um, Jacob Wiggins, the planning department, yes, I agree. And I think going forward, you'll see them worded that way. Okay. I'll Sorry. try to pay more attention to ands and semicolons and whatnot. Councilman so, Shule. So just to, to further confuse the issue. <laughs> it hurts my feelings, Mr. Mayor. I'll just <laughs> Yes, sir, in my usual way to just to try to further confuse the issue. So what would I think would be helpful, Jacob, is if it said that where it says second motion 
to adopt a constituency that, that the next line be up there as part of that. Is that what you're thinking of doing? Okay. If I might, Pat Young with Planning Department, I just, there have, I think you all are well aware there have been a number of changes to state law over the last two sessions that have modified the order in which we need to do these. Very honestly, we've been struggling through the most um, um, logical and intuitive way to structure these, and, and we're still struggling, but we will work uh, with the manager's office and the clerk to make sure that we refine this so that it's more consistent and, and more intuitive. Thank you. Please, sir. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate y'all. Thank you. Okay, the final item is item 28. Initial zoning for 4618 Hobson Road, Z 17000388. Thank you. Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Um, as I'm sure the council is aware, um, in June of this year, the North Carolina General, General Assembly um, annexed 56 donut holes into the city's jurisdiction. Um, on July 31st of this year, there was a technical corrections bill applied to that. Um, part of those technical corrections annexed the property located at 4618 Hobson Road into the city's jurisdiction, <coughs> um, as it was inadvertently left out of the original bill. Um, so now that that parcel is in the city limits proper, um, a zoning designation must be established. Staff is recommending a exact translation of the county designated zoning of residential rural. Um, given that this action uh, for the annexation has already taken place, there was no fiscal analysis nor extension agreement required. Um, once again, there are two motions to approve this item. The first one is to just a consistency statement. The second motion would be to adopt an initial zoning ordinance. I mean, I'm happy to answer any questions that the council may have regarding this item. Uh, you've heard the staff report. The public hearing, the public hearing is open. Uh, questions by members of the staff? Hearing none, is there anyone in the audience that wants to speak on this item? No one that signed up to speak? Uh, let the record reflect that no one signed up to speak on this item and declare the public hearing to be closed and asked by the council. I move the consistency statement. Second. <laughs> second. <laughs> and proud to move and second, Madam Clerk, we open the vote. Open the vote. Close the vote. It passes 7 0. And I'll move the initial zoning ordinance. I'll second that as well. We open the vote. Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Okay. Any other items to come before the council? For the closed session? Meetings adjourned, going to closed session per the request by the city manager. Where do we do this? Uh, let me just go up to our conference room. I think we can do okay. it probably quicker than by the time we get all the. Okay. Okay. Already did that. You can just jump backstairs. Oh, okay. We did that when we accepted this priority. <sighs> okay.